For the bereaved, the closure they are seeking may only come from forensic genetics. DNA is going to be the way to give these people answers. The directions for a human being are written in code, three billion letters long. These instructions tell our bodies how to live, how to grow, how to die. Researchers call this code the sequence. I'm Lucky Severson. Welcome to Secrets of the Sequence. September 11, devastation almost beyond imagining. A pair of 110-story skyscrapers reduced to a million tons of rubble and lost in the wreckage the remains of almost 3,000 people. At last count, just over 700, about a quarter of those who died in a terrorist attack have been positively identified. For 130 of the victims, genetic testing, DNA evidence, was the only way to identify the remains. It is a monumental task, but the New York City Medical Examiner's Office received help from genetic techniques and computer software developed half a world away. In July 1995, Bosnia was at war. In the eastern part of the Balkan country, some of the worst atrocities of the war were about to take place. Shells began raining down on the town of Srebrenica. At least 7,000 Muslim men and boys vanished over a five-day period as Srebrenica fell to the Bosnian Serbs. Six years later, about 3,500 bodies have been recovered from the area, but only a handful have been identified. Most are so badly decomposed that traditional identification techniques simply don't work. So Bosnians turned to forensic genetics for help, DNA analysis. Science won't bring back lost loved ones, but it might give some closure to their families. Most of the bodies would have been unidentifiable with traditional classical forensic science. So DNA is going to be the way to give these people answers. Muvlita Masic and her husband Azim and their five children were living in Srebrenica at the time of the attack. It was fire from everywhere. We couldn't figure out from where. Grenades, shotguns, everything. We just couldn't figure out from where, but from everywhere there was fire. I saw people wounded, I saw people dying, but you had no place to go. During all the confusion that followed, Mavlita and her children were separated from her husband. That morning, July 11th, was the last time she'd ever see him. Mavlita's father and brother are also missing. It is very hard for me because I would like to know if they are alive, or they are missing, or where they are. The first step is to recover the bodies, a difficult task since the victims were sometimes moved several times to stay one step ahead of the investigators. But local officials often receive tips of mass grave sites like this one. Then comes the terrible task of exhuming the remains. The workers dig up boots, clothing and body parts. Once the remains are located, they are transported to morgues. About 4,400 body bags and paper sacks filled with personal belongings are stacked floor to ceiling in refrigerated rooms. This evidence is all the International Commission on Missing Persons has to work with. Although forensic technology has improved in recent years, it's still not much to go on. In the United States, most Western countries, you usually have other information that helps you, like dental records, something else that's very strong in the identification process. In this region out here, those records don't exist. So the ICMP is turning to survivors for help. They collect bone samples from victims and blood from survivors. Today, Mavlita and her children are giving blood samples, hoping one of the victims will match, hoping to find a husband and father. Workers take four dots of blood from each donor and place them on specially treated cards that help preserve the DNA. 
Officials believe they'll need an average of at least two blood donors to identify each missing person. The samples are tested for both nuclear and mitochondrial DNA. There are two places in a human cell where DNA can be found. One is the nucleus, where DNA is stored in chromosomes. Nuclear DNA is unique for each individual, with half inherited from the mother and half from the father. Researchers look at sites on the DNA where variations commonly occur to make positive identification. But also in the human cell are 10,000 small energy producing units called mitochondria. And in each mitochondrion are circular rings of DNA. That DNA is inherited only from the mother. Mitochondrial DNA is much more plentiful than DNA from the nucleus and it lasts longer. But it only determines the maternal lineage. If a family is missing more than one member, mitochondrial DNA can't tell one sibling from another. And another problem with the test. In Bosnia, there are families with no surviving female members. In Bosnia, we have situations where whole communities perished, much like Srebrenica, where we have a numerous of maternal relatives perished together. Therefore, in such instances, mitochondrial DNA cannot be used as a conclusive type of, of data which will provide us with the identification so we have to use also some other methods. That's when a third type of testing is used, testing for sex chromosomes. While women have two X chromosomes, men have an X and a Y chromosome. Just as mitochondrial DNA can trace a child back to its mother, a Y chromosome test can trace a son back to his father. Since most of the missing are men, this is a critical tool in the identification process. The reason why we do all three of these tests is because with combination of all three testing can give us much higher probabilities and much higher tools in order in the identifying process. While blood samples from the survivors are being tested, bone samples from the victims are sent to a lab in Sarajevo. DNA can be obtained from any tissue, and many times bone is the only thing left. The bone is ground up and processed to get at the all-important DNA. Fluorescent molecules are attached to key regions of the DNA, then it's run through a DNA sequencing machine. The machine creates DNA profiles, genetic portraits of people that can be compared. Though each individual looks similar, there are slight variations. And those small variations are picked up by the computer and generated into a DNA fingerprint. The fingerprints and profiles created from the blood and bone samples are then fed into a specially designed computer database. Scientists try to match up the victim's profiles with those of survivors. The International Commission on Missing Persons estimates that half a million people in the Balkan region are missing a loved one. Like Mavlita and her children, they're all looking for answers. Mavlita hopes the blood samples she and her children donated will help investigators find out what happened to her husband, her father, and her brother. I would love that they're alive. Any one of them is just alive. If they're dead, that we find that we can identify any bone, anything, just that we know, that we know where they are. The Secrets of the Sequence teaching materials were developed at Virginia Commonwealth University with funding from the National Academy of Sciences and the Pfizer Foundation. The original public television series, Secrets of the Sequence, was produced by Ward Television with funding from Pfizer, the Pfizer Foundation, Oracle, and the Council for Biotechnology Information. Special thanks to member institutions of the series advisory board, consisting of Virginia Commonwealth University, Harvard University, University of Wisconsin, University of Michigan, University of California at San Francisco, and the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology, Cambridge, England.